Okay, everyone. Welcome back from the break. I hope that you had a chance to um, go and see more of these booths. I see a lot of the yellow shirts from our graduate students. It's so much fun out there, and I've heard a lot of great feedback. So I thanked all the students when you guys weren't in here. I just, let's give them. Oh, gosh, I forgot about that. I'm so used to having a mask on. <laughs> this is why it's great that the university um, allowed us to, to do this by having the rapid test. So um, anyway, what I was garbling under my mask was that I've heard a lot of great feedback um, about all of the graduate students that are running the booths. You guys are doing a phenomenal job. I thanked you when you weren't here, but let's give them a round of applause. Okay, so we are thrilled to bring NeuroBlitz back by popular demand. We started NeuroBlitz last year during our online NeuroFest. And so now I'd like to invite um, Dr. Costas Zarbalas up to the podium to share more about what the NeuroBlitz competition is. First, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Zarbalas. He's the co-chair of, of NeuroFest, and he's an associate professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. He's also the president of the local chapter of the Society for Neuroscience, and we're deeply grateful for the chapter's sponsorship of this portion of our program. So, Dr. Zarbalas. Everybody can hear me? Yeah, apparently. Well, <laughs> thank you, Dr. McAllister. So this is my second year that I'm working with the students for this NeuroBlitz presentations, and I'm very proud of this year's contestants, as it was also last year's. Uh, so NeuroBlitz challenges our graduate students to sum up their research in a concise and succinct talk similar to an elevator pitch uh, that is geared towards a uh, general audience. So each student will have three minutes to present their research. Our student assistant, Kaylee, and I'm not sure who Kaylee is. Is it you? Hi, Kaylee. Uh, will keep time and let our speakers uh, know when their time is coming uh, to a close. So as a member of the audience, your help is requested too. Uh, we need you to vote for your favorite NeuroBlitz presentation and on how well the students, and basically assess how well the students did uh, in engaging the audience and how clearly they communicated the significance and concepts of their research. Uh, once all of our contestants have been given their brief talks, uh, please take out the ballot uh, in your program, you should find one there, and cast your vote for your favorite NeuroBlitz. So the student with the most votes will win a $200 award, which is sponsored by the Society for Neurosciences local chapter. Uh, the winner will be announced by the end of the day. And now let me introduce this year's NeuroBlitz graduate student contestants. So the first contestant is uh, Jesse Badley, who joined the UC Davis Pharmacology and Toxicology graduate group in 2020. She studies the neurotoxic effects of developmental exposures to lower chlorinated uh, PVCs using uh, primary neuronal cell cultures. Uh, Jesse currently trains in Dr. Pamela Lyons' laboratory. So the second contestant will be, oh, is unfortunately Jasmine Cardna, Cardna, and only unfortunately because she cannot present. Uh, so Jasmine had an unexpected family commitment and will not be able to participate. Uh, so feel free to cross her name off from the ballot. The third contestant will be Lucas Cuya, uh, also from Dr. Pamela Lyons' lab. Uh, so he's interested in understanding molecular and cell mechanisms underlying neurodegeneration. Uh, with the goal of helping patients afflicted with this neurodegenerative diseases. And he joined the neuroscience PhD program in, nine, in 2021. And our last contestant will be Stephanie Lozano from Alex Nord's Labs, uh, he, uh, who began her PhD program here in 2020. Uh, her research interests are rooted in understanding the molecular and cellular interactions of the neuroimmune interface uh, in health and disease. So NeuroBlitz is a fast-paced competition, and there will be no time for questions at the end of it. So however, we hope that short pitches will stimulate your curiosity and encourage you to connect with them throughout the day. So I'm sure they will be available for questions later on. Um, and with that, uh, I'm handing the stage over to Jesse. Hello, everybody. How are you today? <laughs> 
So I'm going to be talking a little bit about my research as it pertains to neurodevelopmental disorders. So autism prevalence has increased 178% since the year 2000. And as prevalence increases, so do the costs associated with medical and non-medical services like education, early behavioral interventions, even caretaker costs. In a 2020 survey done by the CDC, they found that one in 54 people was diagnosed with autism. But when we dig deeper into the why, research has shown that no single genetic anomaly is the answer. It's actually a combination of gene and environment interactions. We're truly products of our environment. <laughs> and even though we might not be able to point the finger at one specific gene, we can do things to mitigate these risk factors in our environment. So let's talk a little bit about brain cell development. There's this incredibly important window of time when brain cells called neurons are working hard through a series of developmental stages. Um, and research has shown that maternal exposure during this uh, time actually can impair fetal, maternal exposure to environmental toxins can actually impair fetal brain development. Um, and so depending on when this exposure happens, this can lead to an imbalance of brain connections. The input and the output don't match essentially. And uh, so many, this is a common trait in many neurodevelopmental neurodeve disorders, including autism spectrum disorder. So one of those environmental toxins that I'm very interested in is a group of synthetic chemicals called PCBs, poly polychlorinated biphenyls. Legacy PCBs were used heavily in production of building materials uh, that we see up here, like paints, caulkings, building sidings, um, pesticides, newspaper inks. Um, and up until their ban and they were used very heavily up until their ban in 1979 for having cancer-causing properties. And although they're no longer in production, we're finding new contemporary PCBs popping up, and still they're still very much a problem. They're being found in our food, they're being found in water, they're also being found uh, in our schools. These PCBs also showed up in a UC Davis marble study in the serum of mothers, pregnant mothers that were at risk for having another child with a developmental disorder. So our lab has begun testing these compounds and found that PCB11, one of, those major, one of the major contemporary PCBs found in that marble study actually increased the number of input points. So there's gonna be an imbalance of connectivity. But PCB11 isn't the only PCB, contemporary PCB that we found. So insert me, uh, this is where my research starts in the live lab. And um, my focuses are essentially on the who and the how of, the de of developmental neurotoxicity of other prevalent contemporary PCBs. So by understanding these mechanisms of these chemicals and how they affect our bodies, uh, especially the developing brain, we can identify uh, future interventions, ways to mitigate exposure, and also potentially shape public policy so we can get some of these risk factors out of our environment. So I just want to give a quick thank you to my lab and my lab mates for all of their support, the NIEHS for my T32 funding, and also my graduate group, PTX. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Neurodegenerative diseases can be devastating. They are often associated with increased age and affect over six million people in America alone. This number is expected to rapidly increase due to our continuously aging population. Despite their prevalence, meaningful therapeutics remain few and far between. Clearly more research needs to be done to better understand these diseases so that we can develop ways to help people affected by them. Neurodegenerative diseases can be characterized by neuron death, accumulation of pathological protein, and neuroinflammation, or activation of a brain's immune system. This is the piece that we'll be focusing on today. So the immune system and neurodegenerative diseases. Is it good? Is it bad? Well, similar to my love life, it's complicated. <laughs> Let's get into it. The science, that is. The immune response, you know it, you love it. It's there to protect your body from foreign invaders, harmful pathogens, virus, and bacteria. But you may also know that this protection comes at a cost. Inflammation, fever, pain, fatigue. For the most part, these symptoms are natural side effects of the immune system doing its job and protecting you. Perhaps a more apt metaphor might be, instead of a shield, a defensive flamethrower. But 
generally speaking, the good outweighs the bad, especially when this immune response is short-lived. Perhaps you're laid out for a few days, but then you get better and the virus is no more. Let's talk about the brain. This is your brain. When you were young, a blank slate. But as you got older, it, you started developing cellular debris, even if you're otherwise completely normal and healthy. It's just a byproduct of living. The cellular processes in your brain generate waste, which are for largely degraded or otherwise recycled. But as you get older, these processes become less and less efficient, and you start generating more and more protein junk. At a certain point, the immune system will be called into action to try to clear this potentially harmful protein aggregation, causing inflammation. While it does clear it, there are those negative side effects I mentioned before. But you keep living, so you keep generating more debris, and we keep trying to clear it with our immune response, and this goes on in a state that we call chronic neuroinflammation. When we have this persistent activation of the immune response in the brain, that balance between good and bad, protection and harm, becomes a little bit less clear. And if you have certain genetic risk factors, or perhaps have a previous history of brain injury, then the harm may outweigh the good and could potentially cause neurodegeneration. My research is interested in understanding the mechanisms behind this balance and trying to shift it more towards protection than harm so that those at risk for these diseases and have them can live happy and healthy lives. Hello? Okay. All right, so. Autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder that affects one in 44 children in the United States. People with autism exhibit a number of different physical, behavioral, and cognitive differences relative to their neurotypical counterparts, including but not limited to the ones shown here. As the name suggests, those with autism fall on a spectrum. People on the severe end of the spectrum may be so impacted by their autism that they are unable to live their lives independently. Useful therapeutics have been developed to help these individuals, but due to the complex nature of the disorder, what works for one person very well may not work for another. Now, the symptoms shown here are differences we might expect to see on the outside, but they can all be traced back to differences on the inside, differences that start at the level of cells and DNA. My research focuses on what's happening at the cellular level. We want to know how do differences in an autistic person's DNA or RNA collectively give rise to the symptoms we see at the larger level. Now, autism genetics are incredibly complex. It's not like a mutation in a single gene will cause you to develop the disorder. Plus, there's also environmental risk factors to consider. However, the severe form of autism that my lab is interested in is very strongly driven by genetic makeup. So much so that if we take a mouse embryo and mutate a single autism risk gene called CHD8, the mouse will go on to develop symptoms that are similar to those seen in humans with severe autism. Before I get into how we use those mice to study severe autism at the cellular level, let's go over the three main types of molecules that help our cells do all that they do to keep us alive. Within our cells, we have DNA, which is transcribed into mRNA, which in turn is used as instructions to build proteins, the workhorses of our cells. I like to think of this in terms of baking a cake. The DNA is the recipe that you found online, the RNA is like the recipe that you printed out, maybe made some changes to, and the proteins are like the cake itself. Now, without going any deeper into that analogy and leaving you all hung up on the thought of chocolate cake, there's another key idea I have to mention here. And that is that genes within our DNA can be turned on or off. This is what DNA looks like inside the nuclei of our cells. If a gene is turned on, it will be transcribed into mRNA, which will go on to help make a protein. If a gene is turned off, no mRNA is produced and thus no protein. This means that RNA is a readout of gene expression. So if we sequence an individual's RNA, we can tell what genes were turned on at the time the RNA was collected. What's more is that different cells will be expressing different genes and therefore will have different RNA or gene expression profiles. We can see that demonstrated here. Each of these colors represents a different gene that's expressed at a different level in each cell type. This is the sort of output we'd expect to see from a technique called single cell RNA sequencing, which is different from standard RNA sequencing in that it allows us to see which RNA is being expressed by which cell type, instead of an average of RNA expression across all cell types. Getting this single cell resolution was not possible until relatively recently. It's, and it's super important to have single cell resolution because with genetically linked disorders like autism, some cell types may be affected while others are not. And this will be evident in the RNA-seq data. 
With data like this, we may be able to identify which cell types are being disrupted to ultimately give rise to large-scale autism symptoms. Then later, if we want to develop uh, genetic therapies to help with autism symptoms, we can try to make it so that the therapy only targets the cell type that needs it and not the others. Now, how does my lab in particular use single cell RNA sequencing to study the cellular basis of autism? I mentioned before that we have a mouse model of severe autism that has a strong genetic influence, and we generate these mice by mutating an autism risk gene called CHD8. What we can do is collect RNA from the brains of wild-type mice, or mice with no mutation, as well as mice with a mutation, and then go through cell type by cell type comparing the RNA profiles to see if there's a certain cell where we detect a disease-relevant difference. This is exactly what I've begun to do. So far, I've generated single-cell RNA-seq data, and using these data, we're able to identify a bunch of different cell types. This is a representation of cells in dimensional space. Each dot represents a distinct cell that we collected RNA from, and this is for a mixture of wild-type and CHD8 mutant cells. If the cells cluster together in dimensional space, we can say they're the same cell type. What I plan to do next with these data is look for differences in RNA expression of wild-type versus mutant cells and see which specific cell types may be altered in the mutants. If we can determine what cellular processes are disrupted in the mutant mice, we may have a better idea of which cells are involved in autism pathology. And this may ultimately help us develop therapies that target those specific cell types while leaving the others alone. That was a lot of info in a short time, but thank you for listening and thank my lab and the rest of the neuroscience grad group. That was exciting, right? So please join me giving one more time a round of applause to all the contestants. <laughs> and for the next two, let's say eight to 10 minutes, uh, we'll vote for, uh, please vote for your favorite NeuroBlitz uh, using the ballot in your program. Once complete, please pass the ballot to the person to your right and our team will come by to collect them from the person at the end of each row.